However you're watching this video, inside the device will be lots of microchips. Microchips are the most advanced thing that we make, and it takes an enormous amount of people, equipment, and special chemicals from around the world to make it happen. Normally, it's really difficult to get permission to film inside a clean room, but today at IHP in Frankfurt, Germany, I'm going to take you on a special, exciting tour of their clean room. So let's go and see what it takes to turn a blank wafer like this into one full of microchips like this. Hey, Sebastian. Hey. Good to meet you finally face to face. Welcome at IHP. Thank you. So you're the person at IHP that knows all about how everything works, right? Almost everything. Because there's so many processes involved, right? That's right. We are about 500 people here at IHP and in the clean room are working process engineers, operators and maintenance staff. So I'm really excited to go and see inside the clean room. What do we need to do to go and take a look? We need to dress up. <laughs> Because the structures on the chips are so small, less than a millionth of a meter, it's easy for a spot of dust or hair to ruin a wafer. That's why we have to get dressed up in special clothing to go inside. And by special clothing, I don't mean clothes for a Met Gala, although I admit doing our work in a Karl Lagerfeld uniform would be pretty sick. Instead, we wear these special clothes. Don't worry, you don't have to iron them. You only have to hold up the sleeves to stop them touching the floor. It's also pretty noisy because they use a lot of fans to keep the air clean, a thousand times cleaner than an operating theatre in a hospital. As we go up the stairs, air blows in from the left and the right to remove any last specks of dust. Before we enter the clean room, let's take a step back and understand what we're making. I designed this chip to show the time on a TV screen. Inside the chip are hundreds of logic gates joined together into a circuit. Here's one of the simplest gates, an inverter. When the blue input is low, the orange output goes high. It works by using a pair of switches called MOSFETs. They don't have any moving parts, so they can be made incredibly small. At IHP, they make the MOSFET so small that you can easily fit 10,000 across your fingertip, or 1,000 if you've got very tiny hands. Here's what one looks like from the top and from the side. We build them on top of a disc of silicon called a wafer. These two areas here are called the drain and the source, and this is called the gate. When a voltage is applied to the gate, it allows electrons to flow from the source to the drain. You can see that as the blue voltage increases, more and more orange current is allowed to pass. Building a whole chip involves repeating hundreds of steps, so we'll just follow the process of building this one MOSFET and its connections up to the first metal wires. OK, enough of the theory. I hope you're still here and didn't close this video to watch TikTok, or worse, YouTube Shorts. Let's enter the clean room at IHP and meet the people and the tools who build billions of these tiny structures 24 hours a day. Welcome to our IHP clean room. It has a size of 1,500 square meters and we operate it for seven days a week for 24 hours a day. And all in all, we have over 100 tools to produce our integrated circuits. The first thing is that they clean the wafer. So they use different chemicals, for example, to clean it from organics, from oxides, from particles. So a batch of wafers containing 24 wafers is immersed in the etch bath. In the cleaning and wet etching section, they have 14 different tools from nine manufacturers. These tools can handle whole boxes of wafers at once or just work on a single wafer. My favorite part of the cleaning process was seeing them spinning around in this silicon tumble dryer. Dryers are used for wafers, but technically, they should work to dry any type of underwear. Unfortunately, I couldn't convince any IHP engineers to test this theory, so I had to confirm with the wafers. After the cleaning, the wafer gets a very thin protective layer out of silicon dioxide, and that's done in a furnace. So the temperature is raised up to 900 degrees C. Oxygen int is introduced, and this oxygen reacts with the silicon surface and forms a silicon dioxide layer. Next, we use a process called chemical vapor deposition, or CVD, to build up a layer of polycrystalline silicon on top of the oxide layer. Polycrystalline silicon, or polysilicon for short, is silicon but without the perfect crystal structure of the wafer. In other words, polysilicon is the wafer's unemployed brother, and I will stick to that definition until someone comes to give me a better one. I won't answer that. So far, every process has affected the whole wafer evenly. Now, to start building the MOSFETs gate, we only want to remove the oxide and the polysilicon where there isn't a gate. Photolithography is the fundamental technique that allows us to print millions of MOSFET gates in a single intense flash of light. Because photolithography uses light-sensitive chemicals, the overhead lighting is yellow, giving us that classic semiconductor clean room vibe. 
we put a light sensitive resist on top of the wafer. And for that, we use a spin coating process. And there, the wafer starts to spin and the resist is spread very even across the wafer. We take the wafer together with a mask containing our structures and we load it into the photolithography machine. And there, they are aligned to each other. And then light is used, which travels through the mask and the lens system, which projects the mask four times smaller onto the wafer. This is a photolithography mask. This is quartz glass substrate with a thin layer of chrome on the backside. And we also here see a frame with a very thin foil to avoid particles being placed on the chrome, which we would see when exposing, which would lead to imperfections like short circuits or uh, interrupted metal, um, metal layers. And on this reticle, we have three different masks we can use for exposure for three different layers. Okay. And which layer is this? Uh, this, those two are two top metal layers. Okay. And um, so that's why the structures look so big. Yeah, exactly. That's why you can see relatively much on this yeah. reticle. And we also have there is a lot of chrome here, so you yeah. can see structures. We we have very bright reticles, mm -hmm. like a lot of glass and very little chrome. Mm -hmm. And we have very dark reticles, like a lot of chrome and very little open spots in the chrome. This is the island stepper. Okay. Yeah, we have an island stepper and a DPV stepper, uh, 365 nanometers mm -hmm. exposure wavelength, okay. and this is 248. Okay. Um, this uses laser. This uses a mercury lamp. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is for like the the, the more uh, the more buff structures, the bigger ones, uh, like top metal, the last few layers yeah. where we have like two micron uh, broad of our metal layers. And this is enough for that, for that exposure. We don't need to use this. Usually you only use the tool that is suitable for the job, but it's the least expensive for what you are doing. Okay. That's kind of like the efficiency part behind yeah. it. And so that's why we have an eye line. We just call it eye line. It's an SF150 <laughs> NSR seven repeat system from Nikon. Yeah. And over there we have, as I said, the DPV stepper, uh, step scanning system. Uh, that we use for for our smallest structures yes. for for the critical layers especially that's what this tool is for so i just saw the wafers rotating right why do they why is that uh, the wafers have a notch which corresponds to the uh, wafer crystal orientation to always align the wafer and expose it or um, kind of process it inside inside the tool always on in the same kind of way wow kind of a simple system like this just small line and it kind of just the machine finds the, the line, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Which is the uh, most expensive machine in the room? Uh, the one over there, the big one. That's our DPV stepper. Oh, I don't know the exact no. numbers. <laughs> I just know it's it's uh, double digits in the millions. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. After the photoresist is exposed to light, it changes its structure, and then we can develop it so we can remove the exposed regions. Once we have the patterns. The photoresist acts as a mask and we can do the etching then. So to etch our deep trenches, for example. Uh, this is a reactive ion etching tool. So here we are in the maintenance area of the clean room. In these kind of tools, we etch away material, as the name says. And by do, uh, we do this by creating a plasma above the wafer. We have reactive gases above the wafer. They get ionized in a plasma and um, the way it's constructed is such that the plasma can react with the material that we want to etch away. And the special thing about plasma etching is that we can actually control the geometry of the structure. Unlike in get very steep. steep side walls, yeah. or actually we can control the side wall angle. And this is in contrast to wet etching, for example, because in wet etching, when you dip the wafer into the chemical, it etches in all directions, which is called isotropic etching. And of course, if you want to create very small structures, uh, it's not suitable. So that's why we have to use plasma etching. Right. Yeah. That's like the top view. We just saw that robot. It's really so it's a schematic of the yeah. tool, and then we can click around on yeah. the buttons here, and we see overviews of the individual chambers okay. with all the different process parameters. So okay. you can see there's a lot of gases installed. You have to monitor different temperatures, yeah. and everything has to be in a specification. And this is the this is the one where we just did the yes, this CVD. Is CVD tool, and then we have also additionally two etching chambers in this chamber. Okay. And yeah, 
Okay, so it doesn't just uh, build up, it can also etch away. We can actually build up something and then immediately put it to the other chamber and etch it away again. Wow. So it's like of a combo tool, if you want. Handy. Yes. Just like my nine-year-old nephew's birthday party, the chemical vapour deposition machine contains a lot of different gases. In the machine's case, it needs them. Those gases are all piped up from the infrastructure floor below the clean room. This is also where the chemicals are stored, the water is cleaned and waste products are made safe. It's much noisier down there and even more packed with equipment. To continue building our MOSFET, we're going to start repeating steps we've already seen. First, we go back to the cleaning to remove the developed photoresist. Then we repeat the photolithography steps to end up with holes in the developed photoresist. We're left with a structure like this, ready for us to visit a new machine in the factory. In the iron implantation tool, the wafers are loaded and then they are placed on such a big wheel. And then irons are accelerated, it's like, like a beam, that's what you see here. And the accelerator traverses the wafer and then implanted into the wafer. And we use different materials or different ions. We use phosphorus, arsenic and boron mainly. And with the machine you can choose which type of ions and how deep to implant them. Right, we separate them according to the mass and with different energies mm -hmm. we can choose uh, the depth okay. of the implantation. And what is the concentration of the ions into the silicon? It's, it's really, really different, depends mm -hmm. on the application. Let's say it's from one dopant per hundred silicon atoms up to one dopant per million silicon atoms. So a really big range then? It's a really big range, yes. If you're a fan of particle accelerators like me, first know that everything is going to be okay. You'll be okay, people love you for who you are. And second, check out the time I used a synchrotron to make a 3D x-ray of my clock chip. After the iron implantation, the silicon is pretty much damaged. So we need to heal it. And to heal the silicon, we use a process called rapid thermal processing. It's called RTP. And there, the silicon is recrystallized and also the dopants are electrically activated. Now that we've finished all the steps to build the active part of the MOSFET, the next part is creating the metal wires that connect up all the MOSFETs into the bigger circuit. To start, we grow a layer of silicon dioxide over everything, which results in a bumpy top surface. We want it smooth, so we're going to grind it extremely flat using chemical mechanical polishing, or CMP. So we have two sides on it. One side, we do, we do um, oxide. The removing the oxide. Removing, removing the oxide, ILD. STI mm -hmm. on one side, on the other side of it, we do tungsten. Okay, we do removing tungsten. tungsten. There's yeah. two different processes. Yeah, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Then the re recipe is different, and also the slurry we use is different. Okay. Yeah, that's the main thing. So I'm just done with the process right now. Okay. But I can start the process if you want to see. Yeah, it. that would be amazing. Okay, yeah. it's good. I can start the process. Start the process. The warm up wafer mm -hmm. comes in twice. Then the real wafer we're going to... Oh, so you have like a dummy wafer. Exactly. Okay. So the dummy wafer comes out, comes, comes yeah. first to check the process. Yeah. Once the process is fine, once everything is good, okay. you can send the wafer can come. Okay. Once the process is not good or something like that, you can abort the process. It's just more like, a, I feel like it's a, like a safety... Yeah, safety I like, I like it. Like warm-up wafer. Exactly. It's cool. Warm-up yeah. warm wafer. That's how <laughs> we call it. When I'm looking at the, the polishing, I'm seeing like this little spark of light. What's yes. that? That's the optical endpoint, yeah? When the when the wafer reaches the limits at which the polish limit or the desired limit, it stops automatically mm -hmm. and transfer and goes transfer to the next process. Okay. That's basically the job. Alright. And yeah. then this is uh, coming to dress the, the wheel again to kind of clean it exactly. clean away that exactly. Dirt. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So after using the tungsten CMP, I have to check if um, if there's tungsten rest on it. For this particular process right now, you can see some white um, white cloudy stuff yeah. on it here. So there's tungsten on it, you can see there's um, little tungsten on it, so I have to see what to do to make sure everything is... It needs to go back in the machine? Yeah, probably. For longer? Yeah. So you're aiming between not enough and too much, and you've yeah. got to get it just perfect? Exactly. Wow. Well. Exactly. Our wafer then returns to photolithography, plasma etching, cleaning, then tungsten vapour deposition for the vertical connections, more polishing, aluminium vapour deposition for the horizontal connections, photolithography, plasma etch, and finally cleaning the developed photoresist. All of this has just taken us up to the first metal layer. IHP's process has seven metal layers, so to finish the wafer, they'll have to repeat all these back-end-of-line steps another six times. 
You might have noticed that the wafer boxes have different coloured clips. A yellow colour means it's for internal testing. The red colour means it's a hot lot. A lot means a box of 25 wafers, and a hot lot means your box doesn't wait in a queue, it's always jumped to the head of the queue of the next process. That saves time, but it does cost more. To build a whole wafer, it takes about 600 steps, and that takes three to four months to produce a whole wafer. Once we build up all the layers, the final step is a passivation out of silicon dioxide and silicon nitride, but there we still have to edge some holes to connect our integrated circuit. After all these process steps and all this waiting, the wafer finally comes out of the clean room and is diced into little pieces and ready for use. After the wafer is diced into individual chips, they're normally encased in a plastic package, making them easier to handle. I mentioned earlier that it's very rare to get a look inside a foundry, and that's because the semiconductor industry doesn't want to share its expensive secrets. As well as IHP letting us look inside their factory, they're also letting us look inside their PDK. That's the library of all the things you need to know to actually design a chip. They're part of a growing movement that's making semiconductors more accessible to everyone. In 2024, IHP plans to let amateurs like you and me get our chips made here. And if you're wondering, well, that's great, Matt, but how do I learn how to design a chip? And will it make me a better person? Then the answer is to check out my Zero to ASIC course, where I've helped hundreds of people like you to design their own chips. And yes, you'll be the best person ever. Thanks so much for the tour today, Sebastian. You're welcome. Thanks for coming to our HP. I hope you enjoyed learning a bit more about how the microelectronics that power our everyday life are manufactured here at IHP. And if you want to learn how to make your own chips and even get them made, then check out my Zero to ASIC course and sign up for the newsletter. Thanks for watching.